I just want you to, Psalms 3, first three verses are, are the basis of this song that they just got to sing in the second song. He's, uh, he's our shield and the lifter up of my head. Look, look with me at the words of Psalm 3, 1 through 3 here. David said, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? And many are they that which rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. David, David understood uh, what it meant to, to have people attack him, to have people to, uh, that, would, that would destroy his joy, that would rob him of his peace. But verse 3 says, But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. Now, the picture that came to me this morning as they were singing that was of a, was of a, a, a little child that's, uh, been, that's been hurt, that's been wounded in one way or another, maybe even physically or, or possibly that one of the friends have hurt them or they've been left out and they're just dejected and they're dis- discouraged and they're, and they're down and their heads down. And the picture is of a mom or a dad coming along and just taking their hand, the little chin in their hands and lifting them up and say, look at me. It's about a lot more than this, a lot more than this. Middle school girl got off the bus crying and ran into the house, slammed the front door. And as she came in, the mom heard her say, people, people, I just hate people. I'm never going back to that school again. And she runs by her mama runs into her room and slams the door, and she's crying, people, people. And the mom docks on the door and says, honey, says, are you all right? No, I'll never go back to that school again. And she says, honey, can I come in? No. And the mama says, well, honey, why can't I come in? And the little girl says, because you're people too. <laughs> oh, people can, uh, can really mess with us, can't they? We're, we're looking at uh, Paul's letter. Uh, to the church in, in Philippi. I, I really want, want to do uh, a series of messages uh, before I retire as pastor. Uh, and and I've, I've been thinking about it. I want, I want to preach some messages on before I go. And as I was praying about that, I just got hung up on the, on the letter to the Christians at Philippi, realizing that the, that the counsel and the, and the wisdom that Paul shares from this letter to the Christians at Philippi are, are, it's, it's so rich. It's so rich. It's so appropriate for all of us. Conditions of Paul writing this, he's, he's under house arrest in, in Rome, and his, his, uh, the date of his trial is coming up real soon. And Paul doesn't know if in the, when he goes to court, if they're going to uh, exonerate him and turn him loose and say, well, it's just trumped up charges. You're free to go do whatever you want to do. Or if they're going to convict him and find him guilty, knowing that if they do, they could easily, he could, he, they could easily sentence him to, to be executed, have his behead, be beheaded, or however they do that. And so Paul has got word now from Epaphroditus about the church that he helped establish in Philippi. And Paul is writing this letter back in response to what the news that Epaphroditus brings him. And early in the letter, Paul, we, we see Paul talking about his heart for these, for these uh, people, these Christians in Philippi. And this letter that he writes is a letter that as we read it, you can almost, joy drips out of it. If you squeeze Paul's letter to the Philippians, joy would drip out of it. Never forget when uh, Barbie's, one of Barbie's brothers, Gary, joined the United States Marine Corps. And so he was at uh, Paris Island for, for basic training. And Barbie uh, and Linda wrote him a letter. And on the outside of the letter, they put a couple of three X and O's. Now, they learned quickly, Larry. You don't do that when somebody's in the military. Uh, they, um, they gave him the letter and they put it on the ground. And he did kisses to that letter and push-ups till he got tired. So Gary wrote back and said, I appreciate your love, but please don't put X's and O's on the outside of the envelope anymore. So if we read Paul's letter to the Philippians, it's covered in X's and O's because hugs and kisses. He wants them to know that he loves them. But he also is writing to address some of the uh, the situations and circumstances there. there. They aren't perfect. Matter of fact, when Paul was in Philippi, he was arrested. He was thrown in jail. He was beaten. 
So as he thinks back in good memories, it's not because everything was perfect, but he remembers them. And early in the letter, he gives us a, a secret of how he can be so joyful as he's writing this letter. He could have easily looked and said, hey, I, hey, you know, that's y'all's problems. Listen, I'm, I'm more serious stuff right here. That I'm, getting, I'm facing trial, and I don't know what's going to happen. And he could, have, he, could have had, he could have been dejected. His head could have been down. He could have been depressed, discouraged, and any other D word that you can think of if you're an acronym person there with that. But, but God has lifted it. God has literally taken Paul's head, face in his hands, and lifted him up. He's a lifter of our head. And he said, now, Paul, I don't want you to lose your joy because of the circumstances around you. Look, Paul, there's a secret. And Paul lets us in on that secret with verse 21 of chapter 1. And the secret of not letting circumstances determine how happy we are or how joyful we are is what? It's what kind of mind? It's a single mind. All right? Write these down somewhere in your Bible, something so you don't forget them, because I'm going to ask you again, probably about these. And verse 21 says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is Cain. So Paul said, hey, if, 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 I, if, there, if I'm executed, if I never see you again, I want you to know this has been great victory. Not defeat, but victory, because now I'm with the one that I serve, and the one who, that loved me, and the one that changed my life on that day, on that road to Damascus, when, he met, when I met him face to face. But if for some reason they, 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 I continue to live, they let me live, or they set me free, he said, I want you to know that I do that for one purpose and one purpose only. And it's not about what happens to Paul. He says it's about Jesus Christ. For me to live is Christ. And it's about the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because So Paul then could endure and face all kinds of circumstances, difficult circumstances, and those circumstances didn't sway him and didn't steal him of his joy because he was living for Christ. And so we, t we see that as a great key. Now, but also early in the letter, in verse 14 through 18, Paul talks about people that were, that were uh, preaching, hoping to do him harm. And about people that were saying things that, uh, that weren't true necessarily. And Paul lets us in on, on another secret here, that, that, that not only circumstances aren't going to rob his joy, but he's not going to let people rob him of his joy. Even in the, the news that Paul gets back from uh, Epaphroditus about the, the people in Philippi, and, uh, and Epaphroditus says, hey, you remember Eodia and Signy, a couple of ladies. And Eodia's name means uh, a fragrance. And uh, Signy's name means fortunate. And he, and uh, I, so I'll, I'll mess up Eodia and Signy, but fragrance and fortunate, good smell and, and, uh, and lots of luck. Can't say that, but whatever. And so he says, Paul says, yeah, I remember those two ladies. And Epaphroditus said, they ain't playing well together. Okay, there's a, there's a little bit of conflict. There's a little bit of tension there. Maybe there's some jealousy going on there. But for whatever reason, the, uh, the waters are troubled. And so Paul is writing now, and he, he gets us into this. So listen carefully. We've got about nine minutes or, or ten maybe. Got a funeral. Got to be at. And you knew too, some of you. Okay, so we're going quick. Grab a seat. Hang on. Chapter 2 of Philippians. Paul says, therefore... If there's any consolation in Christ, why did I do my glasses? Here they are. I feel like Columbo. Okay. <laughs> Got my glasses somewhere here. All right. If there's, there are the words. If there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if there's any fellowship in the spirit, if there's any bowels and mercies, he's saying, listen, if there's, if there's any of this stuff at all, then you need to understand, you need to fulfill my joy so that you're like-minded. What does he mean? He says, having the same love being of one accord and of one mind. Don't let anything, and now he tells us a key, I believe a really important key, of not letting people, even the conflict that was going on with Yodia and Signy, not letting that disrupt the, 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 the unity of the church in Philippi. He says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. It's not about uh, each other. Uh, we had, um, somebody got that new living, new living translation. Who's, who's got it? Stand up, uh, Barb, and read it real loud to us. Verse 3. Verse 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Ooh. Don't be selfish. Don't let, it's not about you. Listen to that. Listen to what, what he's saying there. The secret 
of not letting people, if, the, if a single mind is a secret of not letting circumstances control our joy, surely the submissive mind or the servant's mind is a key to not letting people rob us of our joy. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, don't look over on his own things, but look on the others. He's already talking about, it's not about you, but you have this wonderful opportunity of being in fellowship, in family, and you get the opportunity of serving them. Verse 5 goes to verse 3. He says, let this same mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Now, I love this. Paul says, okay, I'm going to give you an example. I'm talking about this submissive mind, this servant mind, and, and I love this. Some people can read stuff, and they love it. Some of y'all are out there, I know you, you love to read technical stuff, and you can read the specs on something, and you can get, and it just, you know, and you love that. Jerry Helton is, I, I need to somebody show me. If I have to read it, ah, man. But if you show me what I'm supposed to do, I, I learn that way. I'm a visual learner, Okay. So Paul says, let me, give, let me give Jerry Helton and those that are like him a visual example. And that's the example of the Lord. He said, I want this same, I want your, the mind that Christ had, you need, to, you need to pray and you need to develop and you need to let that become your mind. What was that like? Verse, verse 6, he says, who Christ being in the form of God didn't think it robbery to be equal with him, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant And was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is awesome. God, Jesus Christ, the creator who was there in the beginning, was with the beginning, and and all things were created by him and through him. As God spoke there with with the Father and with the Son, with the Holy Spirit, was a word. And he was there, and now we have the creator who is, who is putting on flesh and blood and coming as one of the created beings, one of the creatures. And in doing that, he, he lowers himself. He humbles himself. He lays aside his, his, all this that he has a right to do. He could have come demanding worship. He could have come demanding loyalty. He could have come demanding all these things. And he's worthy. He's the only one that's worthy of our worship. He's the only one that's worthy of the praise. But he came humbly as a man. And he demonstrated for you and for me what this servant mind is like. And nothing's more clear to me than when the, the night before his arrest, or the night of his arrest, that they're there in the upper room. The tensions have been high around Jerusalem. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's word on the street. There's a lot of things going on, and I believe the atmosphere is so thick you could cut it with a knife probably. And there they are, and they're busy, and, and they, they've got together for Passover, but somebody's forgotten, and there's no one there to wash their feet as they come in. And all of a sudden, the room and the noise around it, all of a sudden, they, start, stop, they stop and begin hushing one by one, and they realize that Jesus has done took off his robe. Jesus has done put on a servant's towel, and Jesus has done got a basin of water with a towel, and he's begun washing their feet. And it got quiet. And he said, now, you know what I've done? Now, you go do it. You go be a servant. Paul says that the key to not letting people rob our joy is to have this mind of Christ. Now, I'll tell you, that mind of Christ is is a mind that God exalted. In in verse uh, uh, 9, it says, Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name because of this submissive servant's heart. Now, how uh, how do we get that? One comic strip I read said, uh, I love mankind, but it's people that I can't stand. I like that. It's that. read a sermon, uh, and and studying for this research, I read a sermon. Uh, One guy had written a sermon, or preached a sermon, and the title of it was God's Path to True Greatness. Of course, he was was saying that God's path to greatness is is becoming, you know, a, a servant. But he used an example of sports. To, to, to illustrate what it takes to really become great at something. And he picked, of all things, he picked a swimmer, okay? And this got Michael Phelps. Some of y'all remember him? Yeah, oh, yeah. He don't, he don't even look right, does he? He looks like a fish out of water to me. I mean, God's, if God's ever made it back for swimming, it's him. But listen to the guy. 39 world records he holds. Eight it was seven or eight gold medals he won back in, in, in Beijing when the Olympics were there. He received the World Swimmer of the Year six, six times, and in 2008, he was named the Sportsman of the Year. You say, how did he do this? 
Well, listen, when I, when I read more, um, he trained six hours a day, six days a week, every, all the time, without fail. He swam an average of 50 miles a week, at least eight miles a day. He had two massages every day he worked out. He had ice baths every day to recover from all that he was going through. Now, I just want to tell you, when I read all those things, I, I'm like, praise the Lord. I may, I'm glad you made him a swimmer, God, not me. I don't want to do that stuff, man. That is terrible. So that's what it takes to become swimmer of the year. That's what it takes to become um, uh, great in the swimming world. But what does it take to become great in the world of being a servant? It takes the mind of Christ. And we found that in the submission, in the submission of mind that Paul talks to us about. Jesus did everything that he did. He did it for God's glory. It wasn't about him. When somebody said, that one time he's in John 17, one, we're going there. But one time he said, I didn't come to do my own thing or my own will. He said, but I came to do the will of the Father who sent me. In John 17, one, he says, he says this, these words spoke Jesus and he lifted up his eyes. I can see his father lifting his head up. He's just got through praying. You know, he just, he just got through praying and he, the cross is before him and I can see his daddy taking his hands and saying, son, soon you'll be with me. Soon you'll be, soon you'll complete it. And he says to him, father, the hour's come. Glorify your son so that I can glorify you. Wow. That's what ours is about. It's what our life's about. Ephesians 1, several verses are 6, 12, 14, Matthew 5, 16. It's all about this submissive mind that brings glory to him by being a servant. I'm convinced it takes faith to live out this servant mind. It takes faith in believing the promises of God and that they're at work in our lives every day. The promises that I'll, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. The promise is, is that he would guide us and he would direct us and he, in the ways that we should go as we serve one another. And it's, a, it's faith in believing that and trust in that. A servant's heart is the evidence of a submitted mind. When we're serving him, people don't have near as good a chance of stealing our joy. Let me tell you something in closing. Kind of changed, changed our marriage. Our marriage was good. Barbie's a great woman. Which those of you know, uh, Bob, Bob and Gail were to say in 60 years how do they do that you do it one day at a time you do it one day at a time and you look back on it you see God's grace and goodness we've been married we're going to be married 50 years Lord willing come June if you don't kill me before then and uh, it, it, it was two, two strong willed people who love the Lord who are trying to learn and God's teaching us to love each other and, and to serve we were at a promise keepers meeting some of y'all were there and uh, you know how they, they bring these speakers out, and man, they are awesome. They're dynamic. And the preacher got up, and he was awesome. He was dynamic. And man, he preached. He could have sold used ice after that. I mean, it's just great. But it's from God's Word, and he knew it was right. And Jan, Jim, you're probably there. And the guy said, I challenge you. And he's talking about being a servant leader. He said, I challenge you. How many of you men will make a commitment today that you're going to become the servant leader in your home that God wants? That you are not going to let your wife or anyone else out serve you in your home? Man, I was all in on that. That sounded awesome. And before I knew, before I'd read the fine print of all that, man, I had my hand up. And some of you did too. You know, it was great. It was awesome. It was awesome. And everybody was going, amen, and thousands of men were there. You know, my hand went up. And then he got through. My hand went down, and other speakers came. We got on the bus, and we come home. And I was dog tired. And I was ready to be waited on. <laughs> huh? You know what I mean, right? Some guys. You know what I mean? Ladies, some of you, yeah. And, uh, and so I was ready to be waited on. And so I'm getting ready, I'm, I'm getting ready and the house gets settled and just get, and, and the Lord reminded me of my hand being raised. And I'm like, not now, God, it's not a good time. <laughs> you, ever, you ever been like that? Ain't a good time right now. Lord, let me recover from this. But, but you know, it's, and the Lord, it's like the Lord said, Jerry, I remember your hand and all of that. I'll never forget. And Jerry, I remember your commitment. And it changed my whole perspective. Now, I just want to tell you, there's times I've thought, why in the world did I do that? But I wouldn't trade anything for it because it's changed my whole perspective that now on serving my mate, I'm really learning and I'm serving him because it's not about me. And it's really not even about my mate. It's about him. Everything we do. And I want to tell you, 38, 39 years as pastor, 
I found that it changed me when I look at you, my family, and my friends. And I have an attitude of, how can I serve you? How can I be your servant? And I see you doing that. And when I see you doing that, I see Christ. And when I see Christ, I believe the people in the community see Christ. And that's what Jeff's saying. When, when they come to get food, or when they need clothing, or when they call benevolence and need help, or when they come to visit us at church, I want them to see Jesus. I want them to see this servant's heart. I want them to see not a group of people that's better than anybody else. I love that about you because you're real. You're real people. And, and, and God's glory looks good when it's coming out of the cracks in the lives of real people because it's his glory. It's his glory. And it's about him. You know the secret of not letting people, I got two minutes. It's the secret of not letting people steal your joy is to see them as opportunities to serve. Opportunities to serve. Bob Qualtery, he's getting where he talks a lot in Bible study on Thursday morning. He spoke three times last week. His per- Bob Qualtery came up, and, he, and it'll get him when I tell him that he was not here. He came up after first service. He said, Jerry, he said, uh, he said his little girl, uh, he said, now she could be a firecracker, but said she was in middle school. And said she came home and said this one little girl was just terrible. I mean, it was just, she was kind of bullying her. And Bobby said, I'll tell you the secret. He said, you want me to tell you what I do? He said, every time you see her at school, every time you pass her in the hall, I'm, I'm going to give you a name. He said, just go up to you, and, and this is, that's not it, but just go up to you and say, hey, Julie, how are you today? Hey, Julie, how are you today? He said, Jerry, they became best friends simply because it changed her mind and her attitude. Wow. All right. Fred, I'm landing the plane, okay? Let's, let, me, let me pray with you. Read it. Let the Holy Spirit talk to you about it. It can do far more than Jerry Helton ever could. Just his word in him. Father, thank you for the privilege of, Lord, of, of, your, of your word. And your word is so powerful. It's so real. It's so spot on target. And this, Father, Father, this morning, I understand that there, there may be those here today that have never trusted you as their Lord and Savior. And they're saying, hey, I've experienced God's goodness. You know, I know he's good. But, I, but I, I've never asked him to come in my heart or my life. Take control of me. I need to do that today. I'm ready to do that today. If that's you, maybe just from your heart, pray a prayer like this. God, come into my life. Take control. Save me. Cleanse me. Begin the process that you will complete as you make me a man or a woman after you. Before we say amen this morning, I'm sure, I'm aware, hey, everyone is, we're, we're again, real people. There's not a, probably not a person here that hasn't had to deal with somebody that just really has been like a burr under your saddle or they've got to you or, and, and every time you see them, it's almost like they're a joy killer or a joy stealer. And this morning, you just need to, Lord's reminding you, hey, it's that mind of submissiveness. It's that mind of serving. And as, as you be, take off, put on the servant's towel and serve, everything becomes different. And this morning, maybe you weren't at the promise keepers that some of us were at, but this morning the Holy Spirit said, hey, that's who I'm calling you to be. I'm calling you to serve the lowest and the lowly. Because when you serve them, you're serving me. That's not about serving Pastor Jerry and Jeff and Mildred and Daryl and all the staff. It's ministry staff. Man, they're pretty awesome, John. I'd serve them in a heartbeat. But maybe he said, no, it's about serving that one that everybody avoids. It's about serving the one maybe is a little bit different than all, you know, than what you think, different than you. It's about serving him. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And you need to raise your hand, not to me, but to God. You need to say, God, I want this servant mindset. I want this submissive mind. And I'm going to seek with your help and through your strength to be a servant like Jesus. Just put it up. 
put it down. I'm not even going to look. I just want to tell you, you didn't see my hand went up, but God did. And I'm not even going to see yours, but God does. Now, Lord, as we walk this out, it's exciting to know that circumstances and people can't take our joy when we have a single mind and a servant's mind. In your name I pray.